Okay, hello. <laughs> Welcome to this uh, Doc Planner Tech Meetup about DDD and hexagonal architecture. There will be two talks. Well, I will be the first uh, speaker, then we'll have Matthias Novak. Thank you for, for doing this. <laughs> um, yeah, my talk will be about uh, hexagonal architecture, how, why, and when. We will see now. First, let me please introduce myself. I'm Carlos Gandara, software developer at Doc Planner Tech. You can find me as Chauvin on these things. And yeah, this is the best picture I have of myself. Sad as it may sound. And yeah, we we'll start with the why instead of the how, because to to understand yeah to understand why we want to use architectural um, external architecture or, or why is good, we need to know uh, what problems it is solving compared to other architectural patterns. So what I suggest is to go through a journey through another architectural pattern from less mature to other, more mature that at the same time is like a, a learning path for a developer, right? So the first pattern we see is this. Uh, the code, by the way, is PHP, but it applies to whatever. Th th this is international language. So, do you find a pattern here? No? Yeah, exactly. There is no pattern, and that's the pattern. It's <laughs> because the pattern is a spaghetti code, and it doesn't deserve any more time than this, because we don't want to do this at all. We started doing this when we started as developers, but no, not anymore. Uh, funny thing is I only have two positive things to say about spaghetti code. One is that it's fun to revisit after some time. Also, that means that you have it in production. That's not that funny. And uh, it is actually valid for something. And this something is when you want to write some proof of concept script that will live for 10 minutes or the so, then you delete it and forget about it. And that's all for that. Then we, as developers, um, discover this thing that is called framework. And spoiler alert. And, <laughs> and we start to do code like this. That is okay. Now I don't have to write everything to to parse the request that is coming. That HTTP, and I have a, now I have uh, this thing called controller and a router and I can access things with a service uh, container and save stuff and this, everything is amazing. Yeah, I spoil the thing, it's model view controller. Model view controller looks like the best thing ever if you come from spaghetti because there are a lot of things that this are built in the framework for you, but it has a lot of problems actually. Um, if we look at the code, we have we are mixing here a lot of things. We have HTTP language that is mixed with well, it's data centric, so we are passing data from the view to the controller, controller to the model, model saves, etc. We have also business rules in the middle of all this process, and we have that uh, database language mixed together, and this has a name, and the name is. This is bad, and you can, <laughs> and the phone notice. <laughs> I, I like this app. You, you should share it with me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, this has a name, <laughs> and the name is uh, accidental complexity, um, because what we want to do is to save a product. And we are, what we are actually doing all together is to parse a request, get the stuff from the request, save the product, check uh, business rules, save it, return a response all together. And this is kind of what frameworks suggest you to do in their documentation. Actually, this is this is a code example I take from I took from Symfony documentation. Symfony is a PHP web framework, well known. And they kind of suggest you to do this kind of things, and that's not exactly bad because this is how far a framework can go. Framework does not know what kind of application you are building, so they show 
the tools they provide for your application to work. So what happens with this kind of code is that when you go to work, there is your boss, that of course is a cat, and the boss says that we want to add products not only from the, from the graphic user interface through HTTP, but also from command line interface. So what we do is one of the two things developers like to do the most, that is copy and paste. <laughs> and paste it in a console command and this, this, is, this is making money already. So you go to bed and you sleep, have a really good sleep and the next day the cat is there, staring at you. And after 10 minutes of not saying anything, he says, we have another business rule to apply. And yeah, now we have the, the same theme in two places at the same time. And yeah, it's the opposite to dry code is wet code. And this is actually a thing. <laughs> it's write everything twice. And imagine instead of two, we have five places and you have to change five places and remember five places to change. So this is something we want to avoid. That is something that kind of, um, something that frameworks are not telling you to do, but this is what you can do with the framework. So you do it. And, uh, and also we have this thing here that is an anti-pattern that is called fat controller because you start to add more things and more things and more things and, and, and you end with this monster. And by the way, this is, <laughs> I was looking for shitty code to show in this slide and I was looking where to find it and I realized uh, you can go with your, for your code like 10 years ago and this is my final degree <laughs> project. <laughs> <laughs> and some company was making money with this until a couple of years ago. So fantastic thing. Really nice thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, so problems with model view control architecture is that there is no isolation of business logic. Everything is mixed together as we see that we have HTTP mixed with database stuff and we have an if in the middle. Uh, it's data centric, so everything is passing data around from one place to another and saving it and it's really related to the, to the database. Um, it's really hard to test because Everything happens in, the f happens in the framework, so you have to run the framework to run the, the, the code and the test. And it's also data centric, so you have to most of the time have a running database to do these things. If you start to mock this stuff, it's, it's like a hell. Still is valid for prototyping and, and purely crude applications that there are some of them out there. But if you want to do some prototype, but this kind of prototype that you discard, not the one you end up deploying, you know? So, yeah, it's, I think it's good for, for this kind of thing. So, uh, actually, the frameworks have li these code generators and you have an admin panel for everything very fast, and that's really, really cool. But we don't want to have our complex business applications built this way, right? So, we move on to, to something more, more mature. So instead of having everything in the controller, now we have our controller and the controller, what it does is to delegate into a service, right? And this service now is um, encapsulating all the logic to create a product in this example. And we are injecting things and this is way better code. And the name of this is the layer architecture. So we start to add layers, one on the top of the other. This is the layer architecture the right way, let's say, uh, from the book um, DDD and PHP, so this is cool stuff. The thing is that you separate um, user interface, that is everything, all the input that gets into the application, then you have an application layer when you pack everything in services. Then you have a domain when you have to apply something in, in your you have a, a model of your domain and you communicate with that and then you store it in, in the infrastructure but everything is packed in different layers so you don't have this mixing, any, like this hard mixing anymore. So for the previous example we will have the 
HTTP and the command line interface commands using the same service. So yeah, no more duplication. Duplication dots. That's good. Thing is that the day after you go to work and there is a cat taking a nap in your keyboard, and he says that we need to re uh, read the products from some API, yeah, and we have to notify also the warehouse guys because they want to know that you created them. <coughs> so we can end up, uh, notice the wrong way in the top, so you can end up doing this thing that is injecting directly the um, infrastructure clients you are using to get the stuff from the outside world, right? So we have a URL client and the warehouse API client doing some some nasty things and nasty in the sense that they again you are adding accidental complexity here because you want to create a product and you are mixing like URL and authentication and stuff so there are things from the outside world we are still mixing the database language in the middle of like persist and flush it's nothing to do with creating products what we want to do actually is to create a product and yeah, that is suspicious, right? And if you go with this kind of solution, what will happen is that the day after there will be a cat looking at you and will start to ask you weird questions and requesting things like, hey, we need to generate a feed for the products and also we are switching to Mongo because the name is funny or whatever. And you start to have things like this like because you are injecting the, the infrastructure directly into your services you have to all the combinations have to be like handmade so you will create product from URL service the weird machine to RSS uh, and if you are storing into something else you have to create a new product this is some combinatorial explosion of things you have to maintain uh, you are coupled to the infrastructure because this entity manager is for SQL things. So if you are switching to no SQL, now this is no longer valid. So you have to create to Mongo service and this kind of thing. And of course, the tests start to, to go really slow because you have to have all these services up to run the tests, right? And yeah, this is the problem. You have a lot of things that are related to infrastructure into your application layer. Still, uh, layer architecture is, is fine if you do it well, like with some abstraction, but if you start to apply abstractions to this, you will start to move to something more hexagonal. Uh, it promotes the separation of concerns, so you will have one layer doing one thing. Application layer is defining the use cases of your application. So this is this is avoiding the duplication and, and making explicit what your application does. And yeah, you can build good stuff with that. The problems are that um, it's easy to have the data still in the core because we are coming from some framework oriented architecture. <coughs> Uh, we have this potential in, uh, leaks from infrastructure, as, as we just, just saw, and if you want to avoid them, sometimes you end up with this lasagna anti-pattern that you start to add layers because it's, it's, it's what you do. Because there is a rule with, uh, with this architecture that one layer can only speak with the layer right behind, right? So if you don't want this layer to talk directly with infrastructure because you don't want to pass the whole thing, you create a new layer of transforming data from one to another, and the same for the view, and you start to create data transformers, and you end up with like eight levels of indirection just to save a product that has nothing that special. So this is something we want to avoid. And then we learn what this new shiny architecture is. The architecture. <laughs> the good one. <laughs> so uh, hexagonal architecture is, uh, it was coined, but this guy is Alistair Cockburn. He's one of these people that when he speaks, you know, he, he knows a lot. I don't know how they manage to know that much. Uh, check this video. At the end of the presentation, I have a slide with resources to, to check that 
to, to, to go deeper into this, into this topic. And this video is, is really, really, really good. Uh, and what this architecture promotes is to allow an application to equally be driven by users, programs, automated tests, or batch scripts, and to be developed and tested in isolation from its eventual runtime devices and databases. And how, how we achieve this? With an hexagon. Inside the hexagon, we have the application. Outside the hexagon, we have whatever is outside the application. So the hexagon, at the end of the day, is a boundary between outside world and our application, what we care about. And it's also known as ports and adapters. This is the whole point of the thing, is to identify ports that are elements outside the application that want to communicate with it, right? They are defined by an interface, interfacing a sense of a way of communicating, not a code interface at this point, although sometimes we represent them laying in the code like an interface. And adapters that are code implementations of the port. So they are doing the transformation from outside world to the inside world that is the application, right? There are two types of ports and adapters. In the, well, you, usually they are represented in the left side, there are the driver ports that are the primary ones, are the ports that are triggering logic inside your application. So this will be the, this user through a graphic user interface, another application sending messages somehow. And in the right side, we have um, repositories and, and recipients that are the place where we store things, like databases and these kind of things, and um, places where we pack information and we send it to the, to the wild. Somebody will consume them, like emails, queues, these kind of things. Right? So now we will see an example of both of them. So we zoom in in the left part. And we have uh, one of the ports is this user interface with the, with the smiley guy. And how you can implement this kind of port. So the port is somebody through a graphic user interface interacting with your application. There is no technology involved in the ports. Right? And you can implement it. If we are in PHP world, it's Symfony. That is the framework. Uh, it has a router. It has an HTTP controller, as, as we saw before. So this will be a valid. Uh, adapter for this kind of port. Of course, you will have also a, a test driver that is the second part of the <coughs> driver definition of hexagonal <coughs> architecture that can use as well the router and HTTP controller. This would be a, a valid, but here we can have also Selenium, Cypress, and this complex JavaScript with uh, testing frameworks. What else? We can have the command line interface console. Symfony also has a component for that, so it would be a valid adapter. Sometimes you can have an interface for that. Imagine you are connecting some, some code bar scanning device and it has an SDK and you just import it in your application through an interface. Uh, yeah, another application can interact with yours through a REST uh, API, maybe, or maybe sending messages. And the point is, whatever is uh, driving your application to, to have some logic, to, to start some logic, you create an adapter for that. For the, oh, this is an example, but it's not, nothing special because it's what we just saw before. It's implementation of the graphic user interface uh, port would be a uh, Symphony controller. In the other hand, in the right, we have the, the repositories and, and recipients. We can have the persistence port. Again, there is no technology involved in this. We are not mentioning here um, MySQL, MariaDB, or whatever. When it comes to the port, but when you implement the adapter, then is when the, the technology appears, right? So we can. We can have a doctrine product repository that implements the product repository interface, right? And now it's relevant that we have Postgres here. Uh, we can have another um, port that is a, a queue system. 
because we are sending stuff outside our application. We have an interface for that using Rabbit, maybe. Uh, we can have uh, another port that is a feed, and we can use uh, RSS, or it can be XML or Atom or whatever. And the same, whatever you have on the, like, a, you are putting the output of your application is a port, and it will have an implementation through an interface. And the main point is that these interfaces are defined inside the application. What, what we achieve with this is that in our application we define the interface and we define it in the language of our application, removing all this accidental complexity we put before because we were mixing database and things that do not belong to what we do. And then we implement it in the infrastructure part. So here is, this is, a, this is the adapter, a concrete adapter, right? And here we don't care about using database language or whatever the library is using because this is exactly what the adapter is about. And how we use this inside the application, we have the service we saw before in the application layer, we inject this repository and now uh, this is the uh, this is a different use case is to apply discount to, to a product is not involving that much of an API or whatever, just a repository. But as you can see, there is no longer this accidental complexity of infrastructure leaking into your, your application, right? And at the same time, you improve the testability of the thing because it's, you can um, create a, a test double of your repository really easy. There are no these fluent calls that are a really pain to, to mock. And yeah, we are happy with this. We see why and the problems it resolves. Now we will see how it is done, this thing. This, this is amazing. <laughs> they are good. <laughs> wait, wait for it. <laughs> wow, they are good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so one thing with hexagonal architecture is that a lot of the literature and the content you can see around it will start to say ah, ports and adapters and layers and but there is actually no mention to layers in the definition of this architecture, right? So you can put whatever you want inside it. You can have a single class if your application fits inside a single class. You inject in this class the input. Uh, the, the driving port, like the interface for some reading from the console, and the repository, the, the persistent port, uh, the persistent adapter, and you're good to go. You can put more complex things, but hexagonal does not require you to, to, to be complex. It's just about the ports and the adapters and isolating the things, right? But I think nobody here works in applications that fit in a single class. I hope <laughs> not. Otherwise you will have my controller from my, yeah, the one I, I showed you before. So a proposal, hexagonal architecture plus layer architecture at the same time. And why? Because the second thing we developers like to do is to add levels of indirection to things. So we will add layers now and everything will be more complex than before. Cool. <laughs> so the proposal is to have a three-layer system inside the hexagon, right? Um, the outside layer, that is the infrastructural one implementing all the ports, is divided in two. One is the user interface for the driving ports, the, the incoming ports. And the other one is infrastructure layer. They are actually both infrastructure, but I think it's good to have this separation to know how you access the application and whatever you produce afterwards. Uh, then we will have an application layer with defining, as we saw before, uh, defining the, the system use cases. So you take a look inside the application layer, you know what your application is doing, right? What this uh, layer does is just to orchestrate domain logic, not more than that, we will see now. 
And this proposal is through the command and command handler pattern. So we will represent a use case through a command that is a simple object. We will see it now. And there is a handler resolving it. And then in the middle, we have the domain layer. That is what actually is doing things. And is the one defining the contracts. So all these interfaces that are implemented as, as adapters in the, um, in the right side of the hexagon. Okay. So, this is how it looks in a Google Docs way of putting things. Uh, and this is a proposal for a namespace thing. So, you will have your application is under the, the source folder, and you will have modules for the different modules of your application because you can do cool monoliths if you separate them by modules. And inside each module, you will have application domain infrastructure and user interface. So these four layers we talk about, right? And in each module, you will have the same. So this is not one hexagonal application. It's a multi-hexagonal application, if it makes sense. If module three is a shitty crude thing, you don't have to follow all this direction and everything. And yeah, starting from the core and going to the outside, this is more or less how how um, how a domain model looks like. So you have your product, and this product is built with value objects, entities. If you if you go full domain-driven design, you would have a shitload of things here. If you, I mean, you don't have to put domain-driven design on everything. You should not. But it's cool to do that. We, feel better if you, so, yeah. And also we define the product repository here. Here is where we define interfaces that are uh, implemented as adapters, right? And my personal approach to entities is don't add this kind of annotations in your domain entities because this is actually um, infrastructure leak in your domain. It's not that bad because it's not doing anything. It's not that you are persisting stuff here, but for me it's cognitive load that is also a problem. You have to you open product and you want to see what it does and then first you have to scroll like three pages of properties typed with auto incrementals at this with your ORM and when you change your ORM you have to change all your domain and that makes little sense. Okay? Still personal taste. We move one step up. We are in application layer. Here we define, uh, as you can see in the folding thingy, we have a command with a command handler. A command is the representation of some use case of your application with all the data needed to, to, to fulfill it, right? Something like this. So to apply a discount, I need the ID of the product and the amount of the discount. And here we use uh, scalar types because we are in application, not in domain yet. And the command handler can be something like this. And here what we do is transform these values from the command to the domain stuff. We grab whatever we need from the domain, in this case a product using the repository. We trigger some domain logic, we persist, and that's it. Okay, if you have more things like this, it's suspicious because that would mean that you are leaking out stuff from your domain to the application layer and your application layer will be too smart and this logic should belong to the domain that is the smart guy in all this thing. Uh, moving to the um, user interface, this is another way of doing a um, HTTP controller. So here what we do is to create the command from the HTTP request using a factory to don't mix application infrastructure. It's, it's a leak as well. And then we call the handler that we inject. And if everything goes well, OK. If exception is an error. A cool thing you can do here, instead of directly call the handler, you can you can use a bus and you dispatch it <coughs> and the bus will take care of calling the adequate handler and it allows you to add 
funny things like logging, transactionality, and these kind of things. <coughs> and in the infrastructure layer is where we implement these interfaces defined in, in the domain. So this is the .NET repository we saw before. And how we, what we are applying here is dependency inversion. So we have um, low-level classes defining one abstraction that is used by higher-level classes. Okay, so we have a domain defining one interface is implemented in an outer layer and is used in the layer in the middle, but we are setting a contract, and this is how uh, hexagonal architecture allows us to, to change whatever we are using, the technology we are using outside the hexagon, without <laughs> our application noticing it. Okay? And yeah, now we know the how, and there is only one question left, <coughs> is when to apply it. Okay? Um, when to apply external architecture, I would say always. But there is always a lot. Always because we are doing complex applications, right? Here, I mean, this is what I say. I hope we are not doing a single class applications. So we have to take into account the pros of hexagonal architecture and the cons it has. The, con the pros are all these really cool things that I am talking about. The cons is the levels of indirection it introduces. It requires a lot of boilerplate code because of that. For a, you have to create a command, a handler, a factory to create the command. This factory will need to take into account different <coughs> adapters, then you have to create application service, interfaces, implementation of everything. If you are in a crude application, maybe this is too much. Maybe not. And yeah, taking into account these pros and these cons, I think it makes no sense to use hexagonal architecture if you are scripting or doing prototypes. For sure makes no sense using this to create tooling like libraries or frameworks because this is actually what you use in hexagonal architecture to implement the, the adapters. And makes sense for applications that anything that relies in hexagonal uh, in, in um, external technology because it allows you to not depend on the technology you're using and switch it if needed. Makes sense for crude applications even, and you get rid of the domain layer, and you have a like of a smart application services <coughs> saving data, because you remove this duplication that we saw in the, this counter example. And anything more complex than that, that I think is what we do in a daily basis, I think is the perfect fit for that. So the always is actually to always take decisions based on the context and needs you are. Keep in mind why you are doing things and the consequences of not doing them, of not following the best practices at each moment. And um, yeah, that's all. Question time. <laughs> It depends, <laughs> and I will reply this to all the questions you made. So, <laughs> uh, it it actually depends, but I like to put some validation in the infrastructure layer. So, in the adapter, you can check that. Imagine you have a REST API and you are accepting this JSON body. Then you you can validate things like format and all the fields are present and this kind of stuff. And maybe it's not accepted to have an empty, this field cannot be empty and this kind of things. But then in the application layer, you will instantiate from these values you get, you will instantiate uh, domain objects. And these domain objects will validate themselves, value objects mostly. And then you apply um, domain validation. So 
this has to be a date, and you validate it is a date in the infrastructure layer, in the adapter, but in the domain you validate this date is for an invoice, so it cannot be like 10 years in the future and things like that. So there are two kinds of validations. One is like format and well-formed requests. Another one is the, the domain validation that you have always to do inside the domain. And this is my take on that. Someone else? How do you deal with <laughs> good, good, good voice? Uh, <laughs> module dependencies. So if you have a product module and then a price module because you want pricing out of that, mm -hmm. do you accept that products have a price and import a class from another module? Uh, no. <laughs> um, it depends. <laughs> Thing is that. Modules are like independent applications. The thing is that you are keeping them together in the same repository because it's easier to deploy and microservices are hype and these kind of things. So if you want to communicate through two modules, they are actually, it's like you have your hexagon and some other application is trying to communicate with your hexagon. So you have to build an adapter for this communication you will define an interface in your domain and this interface will have an implementation infrastructure that this is the one allowed to use, not to use, is the one that will transform the information from the other module into what your model understands. This is, this is the thing. And the important thing is having one single point. Is the problem always is with joints? You have two tables and two joints? So we've got the, you know, the two together. Mm. I only have this problem of deciding where goes what. Databa databases, are, yeah, we didn't talk about that. But each, since each module is a different application, they should have different databases or not touch tables from other modules. But good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? No? Uh, so when you, you, you said that you recommend using these always, do you recommend using the hexagonal architecture always or the hexagonal plus the layer architecture? Hexagonal plus the layer as soon as you are having something more complex than a simple crude application. And my second question is, you show a monolithic uh, application there with several hexagonal architectures. Mm -hmm. Do you mix those with the filter ones and non-filter ones, or uh, the layer ones and non-layer ones, or do you just keep one at a time? Can you repeat, please? So when you have the, the monolith, right, uh, mm -hmm. do you do every hexagonal application with the same architecture, or you just, or you just do one with uh, layer application Ah, okay, 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 okay. Okay, what I show is that there is an hexagon on each module, but you have to decide, in base of the complexity of this module, if it is a crude module, maybe you can go with the MVC crappy stuff and it's enough. But if each module is complex enough, I would go hexagonal with each of them. Thank you. More? Wow. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, in the, the screen you put the, the UI uh, folder at the same level at the infrastructure layer. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you do that? To make a separation between the, yeah, the left the ports and the right ports. Uh, you treat the UI as part of your, uh, of your infrastructure or Thomas? It is infrastructure because you are dealing with things, infrastructure things, HTTP and these kind of things. The reason for the separation is to differentiate between the driving ports and the driven ports. And that's it. But if you put everything inside infrastructure like 
name spacing it like HTTP, command line interface, repositories and stuff, it's totally fine. I mean, it is infrastructure, but it's to differentiate the kind of ports. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. The other question is, uh, is about folders too. And uh, uh, you put the, the command and the command holder inside the application layer. Mm -hmm. Why don't you put it, uh, the command one to the inside the domain uh, folder? Because um, you, you put the, inter the repository interface inside the domain because it's part of the communication to your domain. But uh, if you use the same reasoning, uh, the command is something you can do in your domain, so maybe you can put it in. You put the, the definition of the repositories or all the interfaces interacting with the outside world in the domain are there to, to isolate your domain from whatever technology you are using outside, right? That's the reason of, of doing that. So you don't have these leaks and, and you are not talking in your domain about uh, MongoDB store and these kind of things, right? The commands are a translation from the user interface to whatever the application needs, application layer needs to trigger the logic in the domain. So for me, they belong together. But this is a proposal. I mean, there are good examples out there that maybe they are not using this. For, I know a couple of them, so okay. Thank you. so it depends. <laughs> Any more questions? No. So I will share the slides at some point. There are some links there you can follow. <laughs> Some of them are from Matthias, so for sure the next talk will be really interesting. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. <laughs>